Good evening, everybody. Welcome along to this edition of Sports View on Near Media.tv. Press the red button to subscribe to our channel, and we'd very much appreciate it. Good evening, Darwin Honan, and welcome. Hi, Pat. Hi, Joe. And good evening, Joe Waters over there in Seattle. Darwin is in London. Darwin has a, a big interest in the small ball, and Joe has a big interest in the big ball. Joe played <laughs> soccer with, uh, with Leicester. <laughs> With Leicester and Grimsby, and how that sounded, we don't mind. We'll say yeah. what we like. We'll say what we like whenever we like. And uh, Devon is over there in London. Great to have you along again, lads. Um, um, boys. As before we came on here, we just got news of um, Joe Kinnear, the passing of Joe Kinnear. And um, uh, we might uh, just uh, the ball, Joe Kinnear. He passed away at the age of 77 um, uh, from dementia. Which is very, very sad. Joe, you, you, you knew Joe, didn't you? Yes, I did. I did. Uh, yeah. Knew him pretty well. I we went to. Um, I actually played against him at, at when he was at Spurs when I was at Leic uh, at Leicester. Um, he used to tell a good story about how Bill Nicholson used to shake them all up and play them in the reserve team just at, before they play in uh, in big cup games. And uh, that's how I played against him a couple of times. Um, but then uh, with the Irish squad, we went to Brazil, Chile and Uruguay together and um, a couple of other trips. And uh, I, he actually borrowed my car one time. We were down at Bisham Abbey and uh, Joe was living in Watford. Yeah. And uh, he came over by train. And he needed to go back for whatever reason. And uh, yeah. he, he used to ride with me to training. We stayed in the hotel off the, uh, off yeah. the Bishop Abbey training complex. And uh, he says to me, hey, he says, can I borrow your car? Oh, no problem. So I took off and did his thing and uh, came back. And uh, he said, I filled up the tank and there's a few quid for you. And that, that was the way Joe was. You know, he was a good, <laughs> great, great character. You know, he was uh, so much fun to be around. Um, you, you were saying about that trip to South America. Obviously, people, for younger people looking at this data, Chile wasn't a great country to be visiting at that time. You know, there was a bit of turbulence there in South America, you know. It, it was really, um, you know, when people look back on it, they, they talk about it being um, uh, an ill-advised trip because uh, the president, uh, Allende, had been uh, overthrown uh, by General Pinochet's military junta and uh, they had used the stadium. Um, there's actually a great documentary on that on Netflix uh, about what they did in the stadium and talking to some of the soccer players that were there. And uh, Eamon Dunphy, actually. Yeah, uh, Eamon was on that trip, yeah. yeah. Eamon was on that trip. And when he came back, he was very vociferous about what uh, what had gone on there because people had been killed in the stadium. I mean, yeah. there were bullet holes as we would walk. We were walking from the bus underneath the stadium to the locker rooms, the dressing rooms, and there were bullet holes where firing squads had been so and Eamon had brought that out and uh, you know spoke about it on the radio spoke it about, on, about it on the um yeah uh, on uh, tv shows and in the, in the papers and uh, he would he was never you know he was banned from being picked for Ireland after that so he was. it was but you know the atmosphere in the place didn't seem to be like that bad at that time. You know, my looking back on it, uh, Uruguay seemed to be much more somber than uh, Chile was for some reason. Yeah. Yeah. Uruguay. But well, yeah, we, uh, we, yeah, that was, uh, that was certainly an interesting trip into. You know, I mean, for a young fly like me, I I knew a little bit about it. You know, I'd read about it, but uh, you think when your your national federation is sending you to, you to a place to play a soccer match that they're sending you to 
a good place, a decent place. Um, yeah. yeah. And uh, of course, Chile qualified for the the World Cup in Germany that year in '74. That was yeah. one of the reasons that, that we went over there was that uh, Brazil wanted to play European competition. They all did, and uh, the. Chile had a, a, a playoff against the USSR and uh, they played in Russia and the, the first match was played in Russia and the second match was, was we played in uh, Santiago and uh, the Ru Russians refused to go. So they were uh, disqualified from the tournament and Chile went instead. And some of the Chilean players did not want to go. They really objected to it. And, yeah. uh, one of I, I, you sh you should really look at that documentary because they some, the players now talk about back then some of, some of their top players and they, they went over there and their results were very poor. Yeah, the, there's a film made a, a long time ago now uh, called Missing with Jack Lemmon. Uh, I saw that. Just, yeah, yeah, just based on a true story about American journalist, a young lad who 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 was killed by the junta. Yeah, uh, just. Just because he was American, but anyway, Shinsuke Lella. Anyway, Joe, Joe Kinnear now is passed on uh, to the wherever he's passed up there to the his award, and no doubt he's he's telling a few stories in his own inimitable way. And, yes, he uh, As this is it. so, uh, we'll have a more substantial thing from Joe maybe down the line. I didn't get a chance to get much stuff together online, but anyway, that was our little trip to Joe Kinnear. We passed away at the age of 77 from dementia. Over the weekend in the, in, in the Premiership, Arsenal, Man City, Spurs, Everton, Newcastle, West Ham, all won. Of course, the result of the weekend was Luton Town, no doubt about that. You know, I didn't mind the Liverpool Man United match. You know, that was just a, a passing by. It was Luton Town winning 2-1. Their next game is uh, with Manchester City. And then after that, they have uh, Brentford at home. So, hope springs eternal. But Liverpool Man United match, I saw the most of that. But, Darwin, did you see that Liverpool Man United match? Yeah. And yeah, what did you to, think? Uh, huh? Oh, I, I, I just keep going back to the inconsistencies. And yeah. They, they yeah. just can't, they can't put it together, can they, for 90 minutes? It's fits and starts. It's spurts of good stuff and spurts of terror. Match of the day. I have to be honest, match of the day two on Sunday night did a really good analysis with um, Troy Deeney and oh, uh, Murphy. Yeah. The Liverpool defender, Murphy. Um, oh, yeah. Danny Murphy. And they, Danny they were Murphy. highlighting all the, yeah, they, they were highlighting all the gaps like Casemiro, um, all Wambasaka, all these different things. And, and Troy Deeney made a really interesting point. So he said when Sean Dyche would have analysed that game that night and Monday morning, they would have been brought into a video room. And he said Sean Dyche would, would have said wan did not let the team down by making that tackle. You let wan down by not covering the gaps and marking your men. Yeah, that's he a fair point. He said, Sean Dyche does that all the time. He never blames the player who's done the fault. He blames the rest of the team because the player was forced into making that mistake. But And I just it, thought that was such an interesting way of looking at it. Exactly. It wasn't a good result for Liverpool uh, in their in their quest for for to, to, win, to, to win the thing. I mean, there's two points dropped. That's what Liverpool would see. But... Um, it's, it's, it's for an exciting finish in the Premiership. And the same can be said about the Championship over the weekend because uh, Norwich beat Ipswich 1-0 and Coventry beat Leeds 2-1 and Leicester City won 2-1 at Birmingham and uh, uh, in, in the Championship, that is. And the, the, the position of the Championship at the moment is uh, Leicester City are top with 88 points. Ipswich Town, 87. Leeds, 86. Uh, Southampton, 75. West Brom, 69. And Norwich, 67. So, exciting finish there. At the, in the Premiership, we have Arsenal, 71. Liverpool, 71. Man City, 70. Spurs, 60. Villa, 60. With a game extra played. 
Man United 49 and West Ham 48. You know, West Ham are playing well and I think, you know, they, uh, I know they're 12, 12 points behind Spurs, but well, I suppose they won't make it now, you know. But they're playing very well. And um, I don't know, I suppose Arsenal are in pole position to win it. Joe, what do you think? Do you see any of the matches over the weekend? Oh, I do. I watched them all. You know, yeah. I mean, the United Liverpool game was, I mean, it was a good game to watch because it was, you know, it, I mean, the, the amount of mistakes that were made in those games, poor passes, poor judgment, and stuff like that. Um, it was a good game of football, some great goals. Um, but, I mean, it was technically, it wasn't the greatest game. You know, there was way too many uh, giveaways, ball giveaways, under no pressure kind of thing. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, it seems that, you know, I don't, I don't know what it is with Liverpool at the minute, but I don't know whether the FA Cup game was still in their minds or what have you. But, I mean, the amount of opportunities that they created and uh, didn't convert is not going to win you the league. You know? No, no. That is, you have got to be scoring. And, and the interesting fact of the whole thing is that Arsenal, out of the top three, have got the best defensive record. They have. And that we all know... Good defense wins uh, wins games. I watched the Arsenal um, Brighton game at the end. I mean, when Arsenal were defending at um, at the end there, I mean, you could not have got air through their defense. It seemed like they were yeah. so tight, so compact, so. Yeah, very, um... They're extremely organised. They're, as you said, they're the best defence in the Premiership. You know. Yeah, yeah. So, so I think are. now is going to be now is going to be interesting. Um, I don't know who know who Arsenal have left. I know they have Villa next week, don't they? And of course, Villa now are kicking themselves because they lost um, one of their midfield players to a yeah. yellow cap. That's right, but. Over the uh, weekend, so he's going to be a big loss for them. Anyway. Of course, they so, have you have European Cup matches now this this week, Saturday tomorrow night. You know, you have all the European Cups. So, the, man, that's, it, that's the other side. And it, it's it'll be interesting to see because you know uh, Arsenal have got who Bayern Munich. Yeah, Bayern Is Munich. They, Munich. Yeah, they lost again over the weekend, didn't they? Bayern Munich. Yeah. Yeah, so Arsenal yeah. got Bayern Munich. Um, it's going to be interesting. I mean, the interesting one is going to be Liverpool and how serious they take their European game. Well, they are playing Wednesday night, I think, Liverpool. I'm just checking around here. They're playing Wednesday night in Europe. Also, over the week, um, the, women's qualif- the women's European Championship qualifying groups got underway and... Um, Ireland were drawn in a group of that with uh, France, England, and Sweden. Sweden. Sweden and Sweden and England uh, drew one all. We went down. Ireland went down over in France to one nil, which was a credible performance for Ireland because uh, the, the, they were they were favourite. They were favourites not to do anything really. They conceded a very early goal after six minutes, and um, after they are playing Bayern Munich. And Man City are playing Real Madrid uh, tomorrow night. And uh, there's a, a full fixture load on the championship as well. And on Wednesday night, in, you have uh, Borussia Dortmund and Atletico Madrid and PSG in Barcelona. And you have, uh, I think, Thursday night, Liverpool are out, as far as I know. Liverpool are home to At- Atalanta on Thursday night. So they're, 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 they're European fixtures. For now. now we adopted a team last week there when um, Bonnie Rig Rose, Bonnie Rig Rose, uh, 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 they're, they're in the League Two in Scotland. I thought they were very quirky. I, I've sent them an email. We're trying to get a few people on. I just thought it might be a quirky Joe. Oh, oh you weren't here, Joe. Bonnie Rig Rose. I know you ever hear of them. They're no. they're 
they're just gone in from junior soccer to Division Two in Scotland, and um, one of their ex players was Sean Connery uh, and a few more people as well. Uh, uh, Jim Neal and a few more people play with Scotland, but they're, they're a quirky, a quirky uh, club. <coughs> they do two all over the weekend. I was watching, the, the one, one, but I just looked up the result. But um, Ireland are playing England tomorrow night in the Women's European Championship match, so we'll see how that will go. You know, it's all where's that being played? Uh, just uh, uh, in Dublin. And what, what in, stadium are they playing in? I think that they play all the women's in Tala. 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 Yeah. And um, in junior soccer, Pike Rovers are playing in the semi final of the, the All Ireland Junior Cup over the weekend. And they went down to, uh, they went down 1 0 to Cockhill Rangers. So disappointing. The last Limerick Southern team left in it. So they are another year gone, gone by. Well, the best of luck. Anyway, they're playing another cup match and they're doing well in the league. And it's Pike Rovers. Um, we had uh, the beginning of our coming to the quarterfinal stages of the European Cup in rugby were played over the weekend. Munster went over to Northampton and Julie lost, so they're out. They lost 24 14. They're poor, they're playing poorly, and uh, some of their players, some of their players are feeling the pace now. You know, they've played a lot of rugby. Also, won in, uh, they beat they won 40 17. Connacht won against Pope um, 40 32, and Linster won 36 22. So a mixed bag there. Now, I don't want anybody watching the golf last night. This is Masters Week. Uh, the Masters is on, as well as the Grand National, of course, as we all know. But uh, the Masters is coming up. But I was looking at the Villier Open. Um, there's a lot of uh, chatter. I know Delman Maria followed up on Twitter. And on social media about uh, McIlroy uh, 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 and his ball, uh, and his ball. I think the rule is, if you hit a ball to the lip of the cup, you're given ten seconds yeah. to walk from where you hit it to the cup. And uh, he definitely took more than ten seconds, and the ball did drop in. And of course, then we had the incident with McIlroy a couple of weeks ago with the two placed balls yeah. as well. So. Really, I, I think uh, I think people are watching him now because of those incidents. And I'm not I'm not saying he did anything wrong, but I'm saying that he of all people should know that uh, when golf is being televised, every single move is is on camera. Every single move you do is on camera. But the Valero Open went to a playoff between Bata and um, McCarthy. They were, they both finished at minus twenty, but McCarthy. Uh, uh, boarded the last seven out of eight holes, which was a sensational sensation. I was watching it last night with my son, and uh, uh, we really enjoyed it. I must say, you know, because suddenly you realise this guy can at least go into a playoff if he keeps he keeps doing it, and he did. You see, Darwin. I tell you, it's put some way to finish that. It was last night. It was unbelievable, wasn't it? Yeah. And, you know what? I don't know. What you were thinking there, Darwin, but when McCarthy was addressing that ball, I knew he was going to fluff that shot. I could, I just, just his body language and he, how he was swinging, he just looked tight. Yeah. And, and um, it was just like, Sue and I were watching it and we're, we both looked at each other and went, He's gonna he's gonna put this in the water, yeah. You know, and Julie, he did. I mean, it was for for as well as he did running the the birdie list up like he did to get to the to get to the playoff, yeah, yeah. And then the you know you get to the sometimes it's just the um, you know the adrenaline is gone by the time you get you get in and do your. I mean, you know that better than anybody. You've been around this long enough. But by the time you get in and do your cards and all that, and then you get back out. Yeah. You've gone down. The, the, yeah, the momentum has gone away from you. Yeah, it's hard to keep that momentum. That's yeah. for sure. Yeah. You're, you're buzzing because of what you've just done. You are. You and are. you suddenly switch into a, oh, I've got to go back out there and, you know, sudden death and all the rest of it. And, and it, 
you know, it, it, it's everybody's nervous. I mean, you'd be lying if you said you weren't nervous in that position. Oh, yeah. The funny thing about the funny thing about it is um, McCarthy is qualified for the Masters, so he's playing in the Masters. Whereas Batha wasn't qualified; he had to win it to play in the Masters. So they're both playing in the Masters anyway, beginning on the, on the Thursday. And um, <coughs> Live Golf went to a playoff as well between a resurgent Sergio Garcia uh, and uh, Burmester. From South Africa at minus eleven each. I, I watched the highlights of that. Good, nice to see Garcia playing decent golf again. He's always a, a decent golfer anyway. Our own he Leon, it. huh? He likes it down there because the old Spanish does it. He's, so he's did a... I see correctly on that um, uh, on the Valero Open that if you the winner of that got. A five-year exemption into five the Masters. Five-year exemption. Yeah. Yeah. No, not not to the not to the Masters, but five-year exemption on tour. But because you've won this year, you'll get into the Masters this year. Okay. So, but then you get five-year exemption to be, to play on the tour. Yeah. In other words, your in, your income is guaranteed for the next five years. It's up to you to make it as a day, Darwin. It's up to you to make it, yeah. which is 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 it's fair. It, it's it's unbelievable. It's as good as we, you know. Now, in well, the ladies, I, go on. I remember when Lyle won the the players when what like Sandy, oh God, when Sandy Lyle won the players championship back in I think it was eighty one. Um, he got a ten year exemption for winning that to the US tour. And oh really? Kind of set was that up, really? Was that the one when he when he chipped out the bunker when he played out the bunker? No, that that was the Masters where he won the Masters by hitting that. That's seven when he won the Masters. Yeah, yeah. But oh yeah, no. that, that was. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, Players Championship yeah. was actually, I think, it was the week before. Um, and he played. It's interesting you say that, Joe, because he played the whole way through that Masters that year. He won with with a with the flu. If you watch any of the clips, he's always sniffing and like yeah. sniffing his his <laughs> snot back up. Wow! But yeah, yeah. interesting. Yeah, good, good career. Um, um, uh, what's the name? The ladies are playing, uh, and uh, they were playing um the T and O tournament, the T Mobile uh, tournament. It was three hours of uh, uh, ordinary golf, and then the last round was the top eight within the match play, and Nelly Corder qualified for the final, and Leon Maguire made the final as well. Now. The result, if you just looked at the result and say Carter won, she's playing superb golf. It's her fourth title in a row. She's uh, playing, uh, she won four, three, four up or three to play. But Maguire came right back into it. Maguire played very well, not because she's Irish. She was very competitive. And really, there was two puts in particular. God, I mean, golf is maddening, pure maddening when you're playing it. There was two holes in particular where I, I gave her the two holes, but the the ball just slipped out of one of them. Oh God, it's maddening. Anyway, Nelly Carter won it. She won three hundred thousand dollars for her effort, and Leona, for her l- l- last, she, she won one hundred eighty six thousand dollars. So, really, it softens the blow a bit. But that was the ladies. Of course, can we just? Can I just ask you, what was the result of the Japanese Formula One race? It's <laughs> oh, just, just the usual business, just the same as normal, isn't it? Business as usual, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Red Bull one or two. And uh, I was watching a bit of the snooker, the the, the players from the open, and uh, Mark Williams, the age of 49, is being Ronnie O'Sullivan in the final limit at the age of 48. They were saying a combined age of 97 contested the final. So it's a cracking final. Um, it, uh, it uh, Williams won ten seven. I must say, in fairness to Williams, we always ex- we know how good Ronnie O'Sullivan is. Ronnie went into a seven five lead, and uh, Williams won the next five frames. Now he drew level at seven all. Now Ronnie should have put the game away. Ronnie should have won two those two frames as well. But that's the way the balls fell, and I don't know. 
But Williams leveled at a seven all, and I said, uh, uh, and he was playing superbly well because uh, he's a superb player. He doesn't get the credit half the time. He, well, everybody's overshadowed by Ronnie O'Sullivan anyway, but uh, just fantastic. He won 10 7, so that's good. He'd be good outside bit for the World Championship, you know. That's uh, Mark Williams. Mark Williams has got a bit of uh, he's got the old Indian eye, isn't he, over Ronnie O'Sullivan? He, he's done him a few times. He did him a few times, but uh, funnily enough, it was the first time in 10 years that he beat him in the final, in, in a final. He's beaten him in second rounds, third rounds, stuff. He has. He's pretty good record against O'Sullivan, you know. But he's a superb player when he's on form, uh, Williams. He's just, yeah, just shots. He, he, he can, he can, he can, uh, adhere to. No, anybody Joe. Will do their, uh, anybody will do their uh, conference that after, you know, the, Press conference naked. He's got to be a character, yeah. isn't he? Yeah, he he said if I win it, I'll uh, do my uh, press conference in the nude, and of course he won. <laughs> <laughs> and, he, and he and he and he came through with it as well. And he came through with it, Joe. <laughs> he looked at us. <laughs> That's very. That was just a weird, a particular Mark Williams. So uh, as we're in the week of the Masters, uh, Darwin. Um, uh, there's some people talking about um, they're talking about um, not yeah, what's his name? He's, he's the golf has gone out of my head because it's I, I'm blank. There's so many people talking about different golfers, you have to make up your own mind on these things. But certainly, um, they're talking about golfers who uh, we said, said it before golfers who are not very long hitters. But who have a record of of managing their way around the course? I know it's a misnomer. Everybody should be doing doing that. But people like Louis who Susan uh, would be one that comes to mind. He knows how to plot his way around the course, you know. So we're saying that he's. A, I'm saying that he's a good each way bet because he's playing well in live as well, you know. Brooks Kepka is one of the, I see one of the second or third favorites to win it, you know. I don't know why. But he's good as well. Okay, he's good. So well, they've, they, Augusta is sneaky. They've lengthened that course again. Yeah. So they've they've bought some extra land again. You wouldn't notice it when you watch it on Thursday. You won't notice where they've built new tees and and they've moved it back again. Another, I think it's gone back another four or five hundred yards. Oh, wow. oh really? Is it what is it? A par seventy two. Seventy two, but I mean it. It was at one time about six nine off the back tees. It's now creeping up towards seven five, seven six. Oh. Seven hundred yards. I mean, to me, it's getting to the well. It's equipment and everything else, and their fitness and all the rest of it. But that that it, you could run up telephone numbers around that golf course if you putt bad, chip bad, and you don't drive it far enough. You know, holes like the eleventh, for argument's sake. Yeah, you know that was and, that was driver five iron back in the day. They're going in there now with like two irons. Yeah, I know. I was watching the Nelly Card, the Leona Maguire thing last night. Uh, uh, the golf and uh, there's 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 the ball, Nelly. One of fantastic family they're from, but she um she was consistently seventy to eighty yards in front of Maguire in her driving, you know, and yeah. for Leona. For Leona to be able to compete with that in her head is um, was a testament that the the that the 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 game went so far in. You know, even the commentators were were lauding her because she's a very good competitor. As I said, there was two holes she definitely left after her. You know, but that's that's golf. That's golf for you. So and of course, question for you on the um, I was we were watching the uh, the. Where, where was it? San Antonio? Uh, Valor- yeah. Valero. Yeah. 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 So I was watching Bate, is that his name? Yeah, Bate, yeah. Yeah, the guy that won it. The long putter. Yeah. There was, there was a big controversy about that at one point, and they were talking about getting rid of them. Yeah, what they did, they changed the rules, so you can't anchor it against your body. You can't hold it up but, here, you know? You can't. Put it into your body like they used to. They, like Torrance, when Torrance invented that putter, 
Yeah. He had you it have to, to his sternum. And he literally yeah. had it here and was moving his, his torso up in a tilting action. Yeah. Um, basically taking his hands out of it. But over the years, they've, they've, they've kind of disallowed it, if you like. It went from not being allowed onto your chest, but you could hold it on your chin. Yeah, and then eventually they broke away. But if you watch the guys with the long putters, it's so close to their body. Yeah, like Adam, Adam you know, Scott. You go, one, it? Yeah, you kind of do think, is that really not anchored? You know, I've watched some of them at the Open last year, where they're on putting green and and from about five yards away, and I'm thinking, he's got that anchored, surely. Yeah, you know it. it it's so close. You're like, if the wind blew, he's, he's definitely got it stuck on his, his body. But, and what difference does it make, uh, technically speaking? Uh, with, it, does, uh, it makes a massive difference. All they're doing is taking the, the hands out of it. So the yips. Yeah, the yips so are, that, are, that's, are, that's the biggest thing, right? So that, yeah, the that, yips originate from your fingers and your hands. Right. So, I mean, so then... That's all a part of the game, though, right? The yips and what have you. Well, Bernard Langer so, changed over to the change over to the to the long putter when he had that that problem with his putting. Yeah. Remember, yeah. I mean, yeah. It, it, the, the yips start with the hands and the, and the, the fingers basically getting twitchy. And if you've had the yips, you can't control the putt head. You know, it. it yeah, I've played with one guy who's who's. Nearly made the Ryder Cup one year. Who putted from about twelve feet, and he yipped it to the point that he knocked it in a bunker. Wow! You know, it's just uncontrollable when they've got it really bad. And yeah. to, to watch someone who's who's a, a proper player knock it off the putting green with a putter in his hand, it, you do go, "Oh, I don't want to watch." And you look the other way and try to, you know, right. pretend you didn't see it. But then I must say, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> They changed it. They a lot of them went to cack handed, so left below right. Yeah, and it was it was the start of trying to take the hands out of the putting stroke. So it became a an arm. If you imagine your, the triangle you form with your your shoulders and your arms going down, it becomes it becomes a, a, an exercise of moving the triangle rather than any kind of flicking with the hands. If you watch old putters. Bobby Locks and Gary Player and Arnold Palmer in the old days, they were all very wristy because they had to make the ball move because the technology was crap. Yeah. The groups were slower. You had to give it a bit of a, a, a whack. A welly, yeah. And over the years, you can see that the greens have got faster, balls have got better. And all they're doing now is they're, they're basically, you see all these different ones where they're gripping it up their forearm. You know, some of them, some of the guys had the short putter or the short long putter actually yeah. under, under the armpit. They had, and and were just literally putting one handed. Really, the right was on it, but it was just there for show. The left was doing everything. Yeah, but it's yeah. really interesting because those those bits of kit. If you went to your local golf club in Seattle or you went in Shannon, you won't see any club member using a long putter. No, and the reason being is the speed of the greens are not conducive to using the long putter. So you're saying it's a, it's a sort of a it's sort of a handicap. It's, for... it's a tour thing. If the greens are running at twelve, thirteen on the stib meter, mm. the greens are fantastic, and the ball just rolls and it rolls and rolls and rolls and rolls. And we call so it saw, roll out. So it, I saw last, a few people. Over the weekend, uh, Darwin, with this single view binocular thing they're looking through. With the range, range finders. Range yeah, finders, right? yeah. I mean, should they know how far it is? There, you'll see like, uh, the likes of Poulter. He'll, he'll have his chart in his pocket. He'll have the lasers out. You know, they've even got the maps of the greens now. The, the, yeah. Each week <laughs> before the tour arrives, <laughs> they have some <laughs> aim point. And they come out with spirit levels and basically map the, I mean, the level, shall we say, of the, of the well, greens. So they even I must, know. 
Yeah. I must I say mean, I, what some... I'll do one next week, I'll actually show you one that I've got. Where, you know, I've we played in a tournament last year and we all got given these green card, you know, green book yardage books. Yeah. And when you turned it over there was a picture of the green and, and me and a few of the old boys who were playing, we just looked at each other and went, well, that just looks like Egyptian hieroglyphics. To, hiero- what's that mean? <laughs> you know, right, yeah. There was like arrows going here, there. And, yeah. and I just looked at it and just went, I, I don't understand that. Yeah. I can't work that out. If I, if I tried to use it, we would have been there for all day. Cause I, I was like, well, and if you watch the players on tour now, they walk halfway down the putt. You, and you they have stand to... with their feet apart and they shut their eyes and they try and feel which way their body's tipping. Yeah. And I laugh every time I've seen these guys do the aim point things. I wet myself because we all know one of our legs is shorter than the other. Yeah. But apart from that, you're going to do a course. Every left to right. <laughs> I tell you, every golf course that. I've been on uh, over here. Uh, practically every player has a range finder. I, I played in a, a tournament for the Tacoma Athletic Commission, uh, yeah. which gives out scholarships for kids and what have you, uh, yeah. for college and stuff like that. We're in a part three. Highland Hills is a part three, just up the road from us here. Right, there isn't a hole, but well, it's there's two holes that are probably one over 200, and the other just probably around 200. And people still have range finders on the part three course, on the part three course, and they're doing it from off the tee, yeah, right. So they stand, they stand behind the um, tee box, the, the markers, you know, and they or they stand right on it where they're going to position their ball, and then they range on where the the flag is. Uh, so I don't know. So I drive by a, a golf course here every day called Fircrest Golf Course. Yeah, and Ken still used to be the uh, played in the Ryder Cup for the U.S. Right way back in the day. Yeah. Uh, with Nicholas and those guys. Uh, unfortunately, Ken is gone now, but he'd always tell stories about the uh, the Ryder Cup. Yeah. Uh, um, but that's his home golf course. And I, I'm watching yesterday as I'm driving by. I drive by parallel with one, one of the holes. And there's guys with power carts that are running 20 yards in front of them. And these guys are walking yeah. behind. About- and I'm, what is what has golf come to? I, well, whatever about that, Joe. I tell you one thing. I was watching the the the, the Texas Open over the week last few days, and what maddens me completely. And I think it, it should be it should be outlawed in the game of golf. You have a professional golfer. Is it Hanley or Hindley? He's he hits the ball, he chips the ball onto the green, and it's four inches from the cup. And he strolls up to it and puts the marker on it and strolls away off the green. Instead of tapping it in. You know, it's it's that that to me is maddening. I just go go away from it. I can't watch that kind of carry on, you know. It's it's shocking. There has to be something done about that. I'll tell you a funny story about rangefinders, Joe. Yeah. Uh there's a Welsh lad called Mark Mooland, who's a bit of a character. He's he's a legend on the seniors tour um, for his antics when he was younger and even now when he's his seniors, right? Yeah. Uh, we played uh, an event up in sort of Hereford. Um, where we got paired, me and him and an Irish lad. Um, I'm walking down the fourth, which is a par five. Mark's hit his ball into the right-hand trees. The Irish lads hit it in the left-hand rough and I'm just down the left-hand side of the fairway. And I'm standing there and I've got my lasers out and I've gone, right, one go, because if you have another go, it comes up with another number. Yeah. Um, anyway, Mark has literally kind of stopped in mid-flow of something 
And I thought I heard something, but I couldn't. I, I was like, no, I'm just imagining. So we keep going. We get to the first, I think it was the sixth, was a par three. And all of us are standing there. And next thing, I'm standing level with the tee box. And I've got the lasers onto the flag. And this voice from nowhere goes, one, four, seven. And me and Newland have looked at each other and gone. Did, did, and you know when you're, you're going, you're dying to go, did anybody hear that? And yeah. we didn't say a word, right? We all hit the green. We walk off the tee. Moulin comes running up the side of me and goes, did you hear anything back there? And I said, what, one, four, seven? And he went, yeah. I said, yeah, I did. I thought, I thought you were talking out loud or something. Yeah. He went, oh, I reckon the daddy's doing it. So I've gone, why? He said, well, it happened back, back on the other hole when I was in the right-hand trees. I heard something. I thought, where's that come from? I said, well, I thought I heard something, but I didn't. Anyway, we get to about the 11th, another par three. And the next thing you know, we're standing over the shot. Mark's over his tee shot. And this voice from nowhere goes, 179. And Mark <laughs> pulls away from the shot, looks at me, and he's gone, have you turned into like a ventriloquist or something? Yeah. And this Irish lad has like gone, I'm really sorry, boys. I've got this thing, it's an app that's attached to my cap <laughs> and it, tell, it tells me what my lasers are actually measuring so I've gone Jesus, I thought I was hearing things yeah. and he said, did you really? I said, yes, and Moulin then goes do you remember back on the 4th or the 5th or whatever it was when I pulled out the shot and he goes, yeah he goes, well I heard something there and I thought, I'm, I'm bloody hearing things Like, yeah. he said, then we all stood in the path three and thought we heard something and in in the end, we we it, it carried on all the way around, and we we just kept laughing every time it went off. But when we got in, he then said to the to the girl in the in the PGA office, she he said, "I've got this thing that this app that talks it 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 says what the yardage is out loud. <coughs> is that is that allowed?" And she goes, "No." Oh, so he goes, "Have you have you?" been using that then he goes well i haven't really i I had it turned off but i think i obviously don't really understand how to turn it off but it was doing it and she she went to disqualify him in the end me and mark went back into the office and said look it happened like three times it didn't happen like virtually every single hole yeah but you know when you go back and go it happened like three times and he kept playing with his phone um he obviously doesn't know what the technology is so yeah. the, the guy who runs the, the, the seniors tour is an old player. And he yeah. came up to me and Mark on the practice ground and said, are you trying to tell me not to DQ him? Because it is illegal. And we went, oh, come on. It's tech. It it could have all just gone wrong on the day for him. Who knows? Like, yeah, yeah. And then they went, well, we'll talk to him. We won't DQ him, but we'll talk to him. And he shot like 81. He's a club pro down south of Wicklow or something. Yeah. Um, he shot like bundles. I mean, but it, it was it was just so funny because when I heard one four seven, I was like, Jesus, I'm hearing things. What? Yeah. It's just, that? He brought he brought the leprechauns with him. <laughs> Honestly, we we were literally like Who said that? Do you know like, he one... was he was totally embarrassed about it all and didn't own up and go, Well, boys, that's me. So I me did, and Newland thought yeah. we were hearing things for about yeah. nine old. That's very funny. I paid I paid attention recently to um, Mark Crow. I think he's very good uh, analyst. Mark Crow. Do you know Mark Crow? I do. Yeah. Yeah, Mark Crow. He, well, he's, he's 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 does he play in the seniors? No, he, he teaches a lot now and does a lot yeah. of commentary with Sky and, and Golf Channel. I think. Yeah, you know, he, he does he does a bit of commentary. He was very good now last night. You know, I thought he's very good, and um, he's a character. Now, when we come back here, Lecoon of the next Monday, there'll be a new man wearing the green jacket. There'll be a new Masters champion. So who will it be? Scheffler. Joe? Well, I'm just going for the sentimental one. I'm, I'm going to go for McElroy. Yeah. He's, uh, he's, uh, 
he's he's just doomed to win it. The defending champion is John Ram, and I yeah. dare say it. I wonder what he do back to backs. Who was the last player to do back to backs? Faldo, Seven. I think. Yeah. Faldo or Sevi? Faldo. Faldo, I think. Faldo. I, 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 I I'd be, has probably done it. I'd be going for uh, Ram to go back to backs. You know. Do you know what I was looking at? I was looking at last night, and I, I should have I should have brought it with me, but people can look it up. The most astonishing record I think ever in the history of golf of a player at the Masters has to be Jack Nicholas. Every single Masters he played in, he was placed and either won it. Every Masters, not one, but every single one of them. He was in contention, I should say. That is an astonishing record in itself, even if he never won it, you know, but it's, I've said it, I've said it before on the program. You know, he's won eighteen majors, but he's actually finished in the top three thirty six times. I think it is. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, it's just astonishing, astonishing. Imagine, record. imagine if he was one shot better a few times, he'd be up in the high twenties, wouldn't he? <laughs> he would. Yeah, yeah. Our thirty. You can have yeah. thirty majors. How many? Um, how many um, majors has Tiger Woods won? Twelve. Four, is it? Twelve. 14, right? 14. 14, yeah. I think, yeah. yeah. Well, he will, he'll win more. Yeah. And I don't think anybody in modern golfer would come near Jack Nicklaus. No. I don't think I, ever... I, it sounds it's awful. Like... Huh? I, mean, I mean, take it out. I mean, there's no taking away from how good he is. I mean, without a doubt. Um, but the amount of players that were around back then compared to, um, especially now, you know, the influx of foreign players into the, uh, yeah. into the system. The and, foreign list as well. And really, and how good the this generation is, how equally they're all kind of spread out. It'd be very, very difficult for somebody to go on, you know, uh, to be as consistent. I mean, even Woods, for as long as he was around, you know, to get to 14 was, I mean, amazing. Well, Tiger Woods was, apart from Nicholas, he was a machine, just unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, if, if Tiger Woods was playing in the Masters on a Sunday in the second, third or fourth last group, you would definitely back him. You know, you put your money on him. He was an astonishing player. You know, astonishing. I think, went, I think if you went back and looked at it and analysed it, in the 60s and 70s, there was probably 12 players in each of the majors who could win it. Yeah. And you'd probably say 11 of those would have been American. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And then if you take it to the 80s, that's when Europe kind of came, came in to the fold, really. Yes. And then you'd say there was probably 30 players in the field who could win a major. Yeah, and, uh, you know, a lot of people speak about, I mean, obviously you have Balaceros, who was Mr. Flambeind himself, and fantastic character. You had Greg yeah, Norman. You, had, you know, Greg you had Norman. Norman, Langer, Faldo, Lyle, Woosnam. You had, you know, there was a lot of players coming through that eight, that span of 80s to mid-90s, I'd say. But I would say, Darwin, in the weekend coming up now, you could make a case for 30 or 40 golfers in the field. Yeah, I mean, if top, I think it's top fifty-five make the cut. Um, so you'd probably, I, I would actually go higher if there's fifty-five made the cut on Friday night. I'd say there's probably forty, maybe forty-five who could still win it. Now, the man they're making a slight case for Jordan Speed. He's run into a bit of form the last few weeks, but I don't think he'll win the Masters. I, I, I think it's hard to say that he won't win the Masters. I mean, well, he could, yeah, but he I, I think I think there's a number of players in front of him. Of course, go, they've got a real. I mean, Scheffler. Let's face it, is is peaking at the right time. He's a farm well, player. He's a farm player, but got, as you know, going the last couple of weeks, he has. And uh, uh, what, as you know, Scheffler, uh, what left him down there when he wasn't playing well was his putting. 
Yeah, but he's got that all back together now. I think so. He's he's been playing great golf the last couple of weeks, and uh, he certainly would be one of the favourites to win it. As I said, yeah, you you can name him. McElroy is obviously in there. Yeah, well, I'll put him near him. You know, Justin Thomas is probably someone you'd go. Well, he's got to have a shout at it. You never know, Caddy. Who's this? Justin Thomas. Oh, is he? He got into his caddy uh, after the last tournament, so he'll have a new caddy with him, whoever they'll be. I know who it is. I it, it'll, be, it'll be interesting to see what how it looks on Saturday night when they finish, to see how it's panning out. Because, you know, you shoot 66 on Sunday, you, you're definitely moving up the field, and you've only got to be, you know, five, six, even seven shots behind. You've seen it with Faldo and Norman. We have weather as well. You have weather to contend with, what the weather will be like, you know. Will there be wind? Will there be rain? Will there be sunshine in camp? I don't know. I don't know what the forecast is. I have to look it up, but you don't know they really. Always, they, I mean, they, if, if, it, if it blows around there, it's so difficult because the trees are so tall. And you get, you get it coming, it swirls around all over the place. You know, I've, I've stood on the 12th tee, and the eleventh flag is blowing into my face, but the twelfth flag's blowing down wind. And oh you're, you're like you're like fifty yards to your left is the eleventh green. And uh, an outside bit for sentimental reasons would be Shane Lowry. Why why wouldn't Rory be a sentimental bit for you? Rory McIlroy? Yeah. I I I I I don't know. I'm not an expert in golf, so people be watching this afterwards. What I'm going to say will sound stupid, but I think for Augusta, I think he drives the ball too far. I know, Durban, I know you might think that. Does that make sense to you? No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you can any I mean, far in there, to be honest. Well, what I'm saying is, Louis, who Susan, who has the game to go around. He doesn't drive the ball as far as McIlroy, but he he no, he, 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 he has a, a fantastic game management. That's like, does, I, I mean, but then, you know, Ustaz and he, you know he needs his short game to be on fire. He does. Because the artillery off that tee for McIlroy is scary. And you know who I love Compared watching. What you know, Ustaz probably won't won't get up on thirteen and won't get up on fifteen. Into. Yeah, I, I I was watching. Uh, so I like. Up. I love watching people like McElroy, like John Daly, way back in his prime when he hit the ball two hundred and fifty yards. You know, whack it, and that was it. I like Bryson DeChambeau as well. He's a flamboyant player as well. You know, I don't know what he do anything like, and I like Brooks Kepka. I like him. Kepka's you know? strong. He He's is like strong as a bull. He yeah. is, yeah, yeah. You would I think, not want to get in the ring with Kepka. Yeah, well, uh, uh, the wind won't affect him much because he can hit the ball, really hit the ball, you know, control the ball rather. Yeah. Be interesting. So, you, what's your money on, Dermot? You said um, I'm Scotty Scheffler. Scheffler, what, Joe? I I'm going. I'm. You go, Mac. And I go. I go, John Ram. I think. To, to, to Joe's, back to Joe's going for a full Irish. For yeah. us. <laughs> Darwin, tell me this. If you were picking somebody that obviously, you know, you could simplify it if you want. Well, they have to have a good long game. They have to have a good short game. They have to have good putting. But what is, I mean, what is the ideal game to go around there? You know, is it to be... You definitely a, need to hit it. You definitely need to hit it a certain distance off the tee. Okay. If you're if you're under under two ninety off the tee, three hundred yards, you're probably on the back foot. But then when you knock it on the green, Joe, I, I can't describe to you how hard it is to putt around Augusta. Yeah, I mean, you know, good putters. Uh, I, you know, I knocked it off the ninth green. You know, and you, you I did, couldn't, I could not keep it on the green. I'd hit it past the flag. And like the caddy, like jokingly, he's like, I, he said, how do you want the flag? 
And I said, I'll just whip it out. And he said, do you want, not want me to lie it down six inches behind the hole? And I, was, I looked at him like, no, I'm all right. And I, I hit it like properly. Like it was a, I, I tried to make a birdie on nine. Yeah. And it went past the hole and then just accelerated. And it went 110 yards down the fairway. Because what, what people don't see on the TV is how hilly the place is. Yeah, yeah. And you, you don't downhill. There's a there's a putt on thirteen, where you actually putt it with your back to the hole. You're actually putting it with. So where you're sitting, Joe, imagine yeah. putting to the grandfather clock behind you. Yeah. From where you're facing now. <laughs> and honestly, and it's it's like you. There's a putt on the fourth green that all the caddies the first time you ever play there, the caddies take you across and say have a go at this putt and you putt it from the far right hand side of the green one of the caddies goes and stands over on the far left and you putt it down through a saddle it comes back up over the saddle and if you haven't hit it far enough so you've got it back up onto the level on the other yeah. side yeah but if it turns it comes back down through the saddle and comes back to your feet. Yeah. And you do it and the caddies are going, you're about three inches short on pace. And you're going three inches short on pace. I mean, how do you judge three inches short on pace? And this is like, this is like good players. I've said to my mates that if they had like nine handicappers or six handicappers, if they played Augusta every day with a card in their hand, they would be 28, 32, maybe 36 handicapper. When you see them knock it around in 62 and 63 round there, you I sit there and watch it on TV and just go, how do you do that? I don't know how you do that. Yeah. yeah. It's so yeah. difficult. I mean, Nicholas, Nicholas says a great um, sort of, when he talks about the Masters, if you ever get the chance to get him talking, he, he will tell you that when he was winning the Masters with Palmer and Player and Gene Littler and all those guys, he he had got his yardage chart down to, the, if the flag was back left, for argument's sake, yeah. he was trying to hit it six foot right of that at two o'clock of the flag. Right. Anything off two o'clock was a disaster because he just made his putt harder. He'd already yeah. worked out in his practice rounds which were the straighter of all the putts on all 18 greens. And he was trying to hit it in relation to where the flag was to the flattest part of the green to make it as simple as possible. Because the yeah. pressure mounts up on you on every single putt. Because you, you putt one and you knock it six foot past and you kind of go, oh, poop. Um and then you walk and mark it and start again, and you go, "Oh God, I got don't 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 do this again." And and you're as much as you can go all the positive thinking in the world, it, it it's there in your head. I mean, you get you get so timid about putting, you just baby everything towards the hole because the greens are like. I reckon there's some of the greens. Nine would be one. Eighteen would be one. 13 is definitely, 12 is pretty flat, 11 back right across that area towards the lake. Um, if they're running at 14 or 15 on the stint meter, now if you think of that as being from a 45 degree angle, it's going to run 15 feet both ways, right? Yeah. <clears throat> if you think of a normal green that you saw with Valero open on yesterday, yeah, they run at about 11 or 12. If you said what Seattle Country Club's running at or what Shannon, you're doing unbelievably well if you've got them to eight. So when you've putted on a fast green and you think, wow, that's a fast green, double the speed at Augusta. Wow. And then have to think about it. Because it, you know, it starts from, from the first green onwards. Tenth, tenth green, if you miss it. Big right, you know when they they see them knock it in the in the right hand bunkers for their second shot. Sometimes where they bail yep. out, 
Yeah. They're not really bailing out. They've actually missed their target zone by about six foot when they hit it in that front right hand bunker. Yeah. And yeah, all right, they're going in from about one one eighty, say. But their 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 margins for error are down to six feet round Augusta, and some holes are down to three feet. Well, I mean, what's his name? Uh, Shane Lowry, I'm not saying he'd win a round. He's he's played there. Has he played there a few times? He has. I think yeah, he's he has. plenty of times, yeah. Yeah, he has played there, yeah. <laughs> but I'll be watching. But I mean, obviously, what the water you have the water as well, whether it's windy, whether it's raining, whether it's fine, whether it's calm, there's all those to continue with. I don't know what the weather forecast. We'll be looking forward to the masses. We didn't spend any time on the, the Grand National, but there's 40, 38 horses in the Grand National. So there you go. You could put 50p on each of the 38. One of them is going to win it. You know? you just got to pick the Willie Mullins horses, haven't you? Yes, yeah. One so, one. how many... How, so, we've got that many horses, but how many trainers? Well, now, you've got Gordon Elliott and Mullins have about a dozen horses between them. In the race? Yeah. And then you have Nicky Henderson... In England, and you have skeletons. The skeletons, they have a few. Bald, Andrew Balding. Yeah. So you have, have Venetia Willems. You have you have them all, and um, I miss this one when, when I miss being at work because we had the old. Uh, you know, you'd have the raffle for the Grand National at work. You know, you'd have, you'd have some reason, but it's four p.m. It's on on Saturday, the uh, uh, Greenwich Mean Time. To be on all the channels anyway. And uh, there you go. It's still it's amazing how it has endured, you know. One of the 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 highest fence in the Grand National is the chair, which is five feet five feet four inches in height. So you can imagine coming to that at 30, 40 miles an hour on, on a horse, and it's nearly the height of yourself, you know. So, and then of course you must land as well at the other side, land safely. So I tell you, it's some, some, some. So some, of the, some of the jumps are lower on the other side, on the land. I was just going to say that, yeah. They are, they are, yeah. they are. They're not, they're not the colour of adrenaline, wouldn't you, by the time you finish that race? I'll tell you, <laughs> you whatever they're getting, they're not getting enough to go around that, and <laughs> do that much. But when you when you look back at it and see that, um, what's her name, Rachel Blackmore won, won, won the Grand National, you know? I mean, there's some. It's an incredible feat of of riding, you know, for anybody to win it, but for for a lady to win it was just incredible. Anyway, I wonder if you're allowed to tie your legs into the stirrups and just not, like, not be like, able to get off it. Like brown tape around, is it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But if you, if the horse will fall, then you're in serious trouble. Yeah. A couple of ton down on top of you. Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, keep you steady. A lot of damage right there. Oh, oh dear. You imagine one of them big things landing on you. Oh my gosh. Well, God. The instinct of the horses are, are to immediately go away from you, roll away from you, no matter from any object underneath them. So, you know, but anyway, we wish them all very well and safety to get around it anyway. Right. But we look forward to that weekend. That's been another blast on the Monday night. We wish all the teams competing in Europe the very best of luck. And the ladies taking on England tomorrow night in the European <laughs> Championship. <laughs> Live from Landsman Road, so we'll be looking in at that, and we wish them well. We hope they'll win. It'll be good. It'll it'll throw the group wide open if they manage to win. Anyway, some of them are good enough to win. Anyway, lads, so another Monday night from Derwin in London, from Joe in Seattle, and myself down here in Limerick. From this edition of Sports, you lads, until we meet again next Monday night. Take care and good sport for the week, and God bless. See you, boys. Yeah, lads. See you next.